Bulgaria falls on me this evening. Uh, I was president of the Bulgarian Society in Cambridge. And uh, this is a humbling task, not only because of the very high rank of the speaker, but also because of the exceptionality of his life and the immensity of his achievements. I will only mention a few points of his very rich biography. King Simeon's ancestry uh, can be traced as far back as the Carolingians. He was born on the 16th of June, 1937, the only son and heir to the then reigning Bulgarian monarch, King Boris III. Due to the untimely death of his father, King Simeon acceded to the throne at the age of six in, 1944, in 1943, and a regency was established in his name. In 1944, the Bulgarian Communist Party took control of the country with the help of the Red Army after the Second World War, well, during the Second World War. Um, the king remained on the throne, uh, but the regents, who included his uncle, were executed by the communists. Two years later, in 1946, the young king himself, along with his whole family, were forced into exile. For almost half a century, King Simeon lived abroad, first in Egypt, then in Spain. In 1962, he married Queen Margarita, and we are also greatly honored that she is our guest this evening as well. During all these years of uh, exile, uh, King Simeon never abdicated from the throne or from his love for the Bulgarian people. He actively helped many of our compatriots and promoted and worked for the promote, promotion of the country's interests. It is therefore unsurprising that when he returned to Bulgaria in 1996, he was welcomed warmly and jubilantly by the people. The king never sought retribution, and while he had opponents, he never had enemies. In 2001, after a landslide victory at the Bulgarian national general election, King Simeon became prime minister of the country, an act which uh, has few precedents in history but it was also no doubt a personal sacrifice and a symbolic gesture from a monarch who came back not with embitterment, but with love, courage, and hope. During, under his leadership, uh, Bulgaria joined NATO and signed the Treaty of Accession to the European Union. I stand here as a Cambridge student and also as a Bulgarian. From our national perspective, King Simeon, although sworn in the name of the Republic as head of government, is still king, not only historically, but also out of gratitude, respect, and recognition. He brought back economic stability, political equilibrium, and most importantly, social unity to a country which was enormously divided in its transition from a communist past to a democratic future. It is often said of King Boris III that he was the king unifier of Bulgaria. But for my generation, this title belongs to his son. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Majesty King Simeon II of Bulgaria.
parents, but this changed very soon since at the age of six my father passed away and all of a sudden I realized that I had grown up almost to the uh, age of 18, so to speak, overnight because suddenly I saw that people would address me the way they would address my father and that there were duties and things that had to be uh, handled. So it was a rather uh, rude awakening from this happy childhood. And right after that, things came in a very quick succession. The Soviet army uh, invaded Bulgaria. Fortunately, because of my father's policy, they came as quote-unquote liberators instead of attacking uh, our country because my father had refused to send uh, Bulgarian troops against the Soviet Union. But anyway, in they came and on their, I would say, tanks came a lot of Bulgarian refugees who took over and uh, from there on, as it happens, unfortunately there were a lot of excesses. We had what we call a popular tribunal, so my uncle, the other two regions, and about 125 people of our surrounding MPs, uh, lawyers and generals, were executed overnight. The new regents came, to, the senior new regent came to convey his sympathy for the executions to my mother and me on the next day, which is something that is really not just a matter of manners, but of exceed, excessive cynicism. But that's what happened, and I was witness to it. And after this, in 46, two years later, we had a referendum under Soviet uh, occupation, which obviously is not valid internationally, but lo and behold, the question was monarchy or republic. We had never had a republic in 1,300 years. Suddenly, there was 94% for a republic, which is, I mean, speaks for itself as a result. <coughs> we then left and went to Egypt because my mother's parents, the king and queen of Italy, had just uh, gone to Egypt in exile, and so my mother thought that she would stay with them because we left the country, uh, I can't say penniless, but we were given $200 each, my sister, my mother, my aunt, and myself, as a sort of uh, money to go abroad with. So we lived in Egypt, and I had the privilege thanks to my grandmother who helped us to attend the best school in the Middle East in those days, the Victoria College, which we have kept wonderful memories. It was founded in 1901, and uh, a lot of very prominent people in the Middle East uh, were at school with me, which helped me to establish some very, I would say, interesting uh, relationships and friendships. And in 51, we went to Spain because my mother thought that it was better for my sister and me to be back in Europe. And in Spain, I went to the French Lycée, which was quite a change from my English school initially. And in Spain, I uh, had, I mean, the fortune to later on to meet this lady who's sitting here and who's put up with me for 51 years. And I studied in Madrid, then I went to the military academy in the States because our Bulgarians in those days thought that the young man who hasn't done his military service, well, was not quite the right thing. So uh, we looked around and finally we thought that in the US, in those auxiliary military academies was an interesting place. And there I went, of course, under an assumed name, but I learned an awful lot. I found it very stimulating and interesting. And then started, I mean, they married, the children came, one thing another. But I had to look after my family, so I went into business. And must say that I've always worked very hard. 
I can qualify myself roughly as a workaholic anyway. So uh, things went reasonably well. And this takes us roughly to 1989, which is for us from Eastern Europe a really watershed date because all of a sudden things started changing, things which many of us never thought that would happen. Mind you, I've followed Bulgaria's history and developments all my life, and nevertheless, I didn't really expect events such as 89 to occur, and that there would be such a, I would say, rapid implosion of our regime, but also, of course, of the Soviet Union and so forth. So 89 really was the date at which things started happening. Personally, I never thought I would see Bulgaria again. And nevertheless, I kept on working in every way I could that my mother had drilled me uh, to do. And so I was very surprised to suddenly see Bulgarians coming from Sofia to Madrid to call on me and, I mean, to discuss what could be done. And this was a long and very trying and rather exciting period, but I seem to be a person who doesn't take decisions quickly or I try to analyze maybe sometimes too much whatever I start. And so I wanted to put my ear to the ground and realize what was going on in Bulgaria after 50 years of communism and after such a short period, so from 89 till 96, I just saw people in Madrid and would question diplomats and have friends and journalists and so forth. And finally, I saw that the moment had come to return to my country without stirring any uh, particular uh, trouble, because that's also one of my uh, ways of seeing things, that not to uh, disrupt or disturb others. And suddenly this return was, um, I'm sorry to say it, but really so triumphant and so unexpected that uh, it was difficult to believe, and yet it occurred. Maybe it was a mixture of people seeing something new, others who remembered my father's times and thought that they were better, or people who hoped that there would be some sort of deus ex machina who would suddenly change things. But all this put together, the effect was really <coughs> tremendous. And so, after these three weeks, after 50 years in exile, you can imagine my feelings and emotions, I returned to Madrid and then came back another two or three times, periodically just to check things. And in 2001, or 2000, was the time where I realized that there was a moment where I had to, <coughs> grosso modo, throw my hat in, not for any personal ambitions, God forbid, but because I saw that this was the way to try and change or modernize or bring a Western uh, attitude, because having been forced to live abroad, I was in the West, and I had picked up all the good or maybe bad things from the West, but there it was. So it happened, and a movement was created which uh, took my name as a banner, uh, not for any uh, personal ambitions, but because this way it would identify the people voting with me, i.e. what they were expecting to see in changes in the country. And indeed, uh, the success was uh, quite uh, unexpected because out of 240 seats in our parliament, we got 119. And actually, uh, we would have had the majority of 122 or three were it not that deliberately some people had placed another party carrying my name too to mislead people. And with this, this 3% is what deprived us from an absolute majority. So we had to look for a coalition 
which to me is always preferable to share power with others rather than try and hold everything in one hand. And so after this uh, very serious success, uh, the question came, whoever wins the elections and the party who leads these elections has to become prime minister, which was the last thing that had ever come to my mind. <clears throat> I was trained for another job, another attitude of being above parties and not in the political <coughs> fry. But at that stage, it took me a few days and quite a bit of convincing to finally accept this uh, overwhelming and tremendous responsibility. So all of a sudden, from somebody who was in exile, about whom either little was known or only negative things by the official propaganda, I suddenly became the king who was prime minister of the republic. And quite honestly, I thought that in a way, it was a wonderful opportunity because what I had always tried is to serve my country, in which position I think it's basically irrelevant. That depends on history or other circumstances and not on, on the person alone. So there I was and I had to adjust to a lot of very difficult moments because of, again, this Western spirit. I came from the private, I'd been in different companies, and uh, maybe it was my mistake to overestimate the capability of changing, of getting people to think in a, in a more uh, practical manner and not so much dogmatic, but it was very difficult. And I must say that uh, the first months, the two things that uh, shook me or shocked me, or both, was the lack of initiative on behalf of perfectly, I would say, <coughs> learned, schooled, and prepared people, and also a real, I would say, almost terror from responsibility, which to me meant that during 50 years or two generations, which is an awfully long time, people had been taught to accept what is told, that somebody gives instructions, and the, le the less you move or show or do, the safer you are. And uh, I must say it was really very, very difficult to put up with it. But fortunately, there was also uh, many people who obviously uh, thought differently, and also a number of young Bulgarians who believed in what I was saying during the election campaign and who left highly remunerated positions in the West, actually in the city and also in the States, came to give me a hand and some of them became members of my cabinet and I dare say uh, quite successful. And actually uh, we had another four years afterwards of my government because uh, after not being the first party, the Socialist Party after four years had the most votes, but uh, we still were the second party, so I stayed as a more or less one of the seniors in this coalition of our uh, Socialist Party, my own movement, and the uh, movement for freedoms and rights, which is basically in Bulgaria considered, quote unquote, the Muslim party, because we are not allowed in our constitution to have any uh, uh, religious or ethnic uh, parties. But anyway, these three parties kept on uh, governing or running the country for another four years. So during these eight years, I saw quite a bit and went through quite a few difficulties, but it was a tremendous challenge. And what I thought was most important was that I managed in a way <clears throat> to calm down the atmosphere of confrontation and sort of 
uh, opposition in Parliament, but also basically in the society. And this is still mentioned now that in those years things were a little bit less uh, <coughs> dramatic. How could they call it? And of course, as Prime Minister of the Republic, uh, it was a very unusual situation. Uh, and traveling abroad or at the different European summits, there were sometimes jokes, other times curiosity, uh, because people would say, well, what on earth is this fellow who's been a king and who suddenly uh, serves as the president of a government and of a republic? So <clears throat> it was a very interesting uh, period, and I recall a couple of anecdotes, but <clears throat> just to maybe keep some of the audience from uh, getting bored with what I'm uh, saying. At uh, one point, the new NATO countries, because NATO was one issue which to me was not as important as the EU, but it was before EU chronologically. So we all went to Washington, and President Bush uh, received us, the nine new NATO uh, countries. And one by one, the prime ministers would walk into his cabinet, and he would greet us. And after that, the next one would come, and then finally, we're all together. So when my turn came up, President Bush, whom I had already met at several meetings, came up and said, Your Majesty, oops, Mr. Prime Minister, how nice to see you. <laughs> and then another day uh, after the, the Queen Mother uh, passed away here, I told our President of the Republic that I would very much like to be the person who represents Bulgaria at the funeral. And so uh, there again I was seated with the presidents and Mrs. Chirac, I remember I was next to her and other presidents of the Republic. Instead across Her Majesty's coffin were all my relatives, including uh, the King of Spain, with whom my wife had come from Madrid, because I came from Sofia. And so there we were, as I say, I in my own official functions, and the others because of their uh, uh, family ties. And at the end of the service, we were meant to gather at the gate of the Abbey to go for lunch uh, to Windsor. So an ADC, an Aquarius of the Queen, came to fetch me. And I was there at the gate. And one of my royal colleagues looked at me and said, oh, welcome back to the club, Simeon. Because I had come again with the royal families who were leaving for Windsor. And another anecdote as prime minister, which literally froze uh, the blood in my veins was uh, when I visited Moscow. I made a point of going to Moscow very soon after uh, becoming prime minister because I strongly believe that Russia is a country which is very important all over, but also in Bulgaria. And so I made a point to be there one, and during one of the first visits abroad. And just an hour before the two delegations were going to meet for different issues, the Russian delegation was led by my colleague, Prime Minister Kasyanov. Our ambassador comes into my room and says, Sir, uh, there's something new that has come up. President Putin is going to preside the Russian delegation and not uh, Prime Minister Kasyanov. So, in comes the president. He's a very energetic, very dynamic person. Sits down. In 45 minutes, all the subjects that had to be uh, looked into were taken care of. And uh, we're just packing up our uh, documents when President Putin leans back, looks at me. And our language, I mean, Bulgarian and Russian, are quite close. So he looks at me. He has a very, I would say, impressive uh, glance or look. <laughs> and, and he said, Prime Minister, I know some not too good things about you. 
I thought I was going to sink. I mean, I would just pass out. <laughs> and he waited for about 20 seconds, which I thought were at least half an hour. <laughs> and then he said, with a big smile, from King Juan Carlos, who was just here a week ago, and I know that you've grown up together. So my delegation uh, breathed a sigh of relief, and so did I. And I said, Mr. President, in this case, don't believe a word. It's pure propaganda, because we are such good friends. <laughs> so these are some of the strange things that can happen when you wear two different, very different hats, I would say. Now, going to the subject which is particularly close to me, and maybe not so much to some people, that's the EU. The EU, in an old person like myself, and a European who has read a lot of history, I dare say, has already one essential basic plus, which such a young audience will not or cannot appreciate, is that we cannot have wars within the EU. These wars have cost so much pain, so many casualties, such horrors. So already this fact that in the perimeter of the EU there isn't a chance for a war is already something which is uh, essential and very important and mustn't be forgotten. And I'm sure that Professor Clark, who's kind enough to be here, after his fantastic book on 1914, will agree with me that the fact that we don't have wars is already something grandiose. Then, also, the next thing is, where would Europe be if we were divided? Each country in such crisis like now, or major economic crisis or other issues, Europe wouldn't stand a chance, wouldn't have a voice. And after all, Europe is the center of culture to, I would say, most of the world. And so, apart from the economic possibilities, which are there too, this nucleus of Europe, i.e. The, uh, the United, uh, the European Union, is essential. It's a sort of balancing element, because we have, fine, the United States, nobody discusses the fact that they are uh, so important. We have the East divided in different bricks or what have you. We have Russia too and other places. But finally, Europe would be a non-entity. So it's absolutely essential to back this system, not because I believe in it, but because I think that I'm a pragmatist and I've asked myself so often this question. And unfortunately, there's a lot of generalization or biased information or even outright lies or ridiculous claims about the EU, which I think is uh, very unfortunate. And little by little, I hope it will uh, vanish and people will realize what it means to have this very important uh, economic, cultural, and I would say human uh, gathering or uh, collectivity because people say, oh, but it takes time or it won't work. The other day I even read that the leader of the extreme right in France said that the EU was like the Roman Empire is going down. And I really thought that this lady needs a little bit more reading in history before comparing these two elements. But uh, quite honestly, I think that it's something very beneficial, very important for all of us, the Europeans. And just for Bulgaria, I mean, small Bulgaria, to think where we were in eight, 1970, for instance, and where we are now, in spite of problems, difficulties, and everything, is, I mean, uh, abysmal as difference. And most of it has been achieved thanks to the idea of the EU because we are, in spite of being part of it now, but still it's an additional reference or authority or weight for us to get our act together, to modernize, to adjust to what the EU expects from us, or Brussels. And so it has sp sped up a bit 
our change, our uh, innovation, because otherwise I think no government would have been able to run through many of the measures because there would always be time or there would always be thinking of elections or something. Whereas having Brussels literally, with all due respect and good feelings towards them, breathing down our neck obliged us to change a lot of things and still keep on. And I'm very hopeful that this will be uh, taken care of. Uh, for us, for instance, we're constantly uh, warned in Brussels about crime or organized crime and, or our judicial system. Well, it'll take some time. We're doing our best. We can't change overnight, but certainly the efforts are there and it's in our own interest. It's not something that we have to do. We are compelled. No, I think it's essential so that we can uh, be more up to date and especially be more respected. And Romania and Bulgaria being the last who came in had a lot of, they were watching us very closely. Now there is Croatia. Croatia seems to be doing very well and I hope very much that other countries such as Serbia or Albania will be able to, to join. But uh, in many cases, in my fellow countrymen, in Bulgaria, we tend to have a sort of pessimistic approach and the glass is usually half empty rather than half full. And I personally always try and see the glass half full. So I think that there again, we can change a little bit our attitude and realize that we are a very, very cultured country with a very long history. A little detail which might amuse you, but Bulgaria is one of the oldest country in having its name, because since third, uh, six, 600, 7th century, it has had the same name. Whereas even great countries such as Germany or Italy, or even France, have had different names or principalities before. So there are a few facts with which we can think that we can really be a contribution to the EU and not just a burden like some uh, people who try to find all kinds of defects or are envious of, of these new countries which are really trying to get uh, uh, to the place which I personally think we, we deserve or we have earned. The trend or the quest for EU was an effort of three governments, the one preceding me, my own, and the following one. And you can imagine that by 2007, January 1st, when Bulgaria joined the EU, this was a tremendous moment and a tremendous, I would say, emotional fact to think that after 50 years of being isolated behind the Iron Curtain, or call it whatever, we were suddenly part of, of the rest of the world, part of a highly civilized community. So this has meant a lot to stimulate us. Now that there is a bit of Euroscepticism, maybe because of financial issues or others, this is temporary, believe me. Uh, the other motives are by far more important than a crisis or some moments where it comes to sharing also with others, because this is something which not many people see when they complain about newcomers. And I think that there should be a little bit more uh, altruistic thinking and not only uh, trying to, to keep the club closed to only the very wealthiest or the most successful. Time will tell and I'm convinced that this will happen and you young people in this room will see it and maybe one day you'll remember some of the ideas that I was trying to put across this evening. Uh, apart from this staunch European support of mine, as I say, because I've lived through so much that I see that this is the only solution. But <clears throat> there is also the guarantee or additional guarantee for investments in Bulgaria nowadays, because we have the same rules we have to go by them. 
And this gives a additional, how can I say, comfort to foreigners, even with difficulties as these years we have a much smaller growth than the period I was prime minister of because of different economic circumstances, mind you, not because of my merits. But uh, we still have a reasonably good investment this year, well, 19, uh, 2012. There was one billion uh, uh, new fresh investments, which for a um, overall uh, GDP of 40 billion is reasonably acceptable in spite of the crisis. Uh, also, the fact that Bulgaria there's so much to be done to catch up with and to renew and reform that these investments are really like I would say in an Eldorado because there is possibilities and we've got very, very skilled uh, labor and uh, that, of course, is something which is important. There's been some interesting outsourcing. Uh, for instance, uh, Hewlett Packard have their European hub now in Bulgaria. There's close to 5,000 employees, which is for us quite a major mm, uh, success. But this is something which can be, uh, I mean, copied or extrapolated and could be of, of uh, really uh, interest because, as I say, Bulgaria has also very good connections. Our geopolitical situation is in that part of southeastern Europe, which is quite a, an area. We are on very good terms with the Middle East, which is a potential and enormous market. We are on very good terms with our southern neighbors, which are Turkey, which is another huge and very important country, and we are on the physical road of Turkey to Europe. So that's a lever or something important for us to bear in mind. Turkey, in its turn, has the former Soviet uh, republics, the stands, as we, we call them. Then Ukraine, we have very good terms, uh, we're in good terms with them, and our closer neighbors, Romania, Serbia, Macedonia, so these are points which are interesting because the Bulgarian market, as you can well imagine, those who study economy uh, uh, will agree with me, our market is far too small for a single thing. But as a hub for this whole area, thanks to these good relations we have, well, I feel that there is an ex extra interesting uh, added value to to our role in that part of Eastern or Southeastern Europe. <clears throat> the outsourcing is something which is also happening. As a matter of fact, I remember when President Sarkozy was a finance minister, I called on him during my visit to Paris as prime minister, and he said, prime minister, let me warn you something. We are helping you people financially and supporting and all this. And yet, on the other hand, your taxes are so low that our uh, companies tend to go to France. So you better watch it and don't do what he called fiscal dumping. Fine, I said yes, Mr. Minister. And that was it. Then uh, my, the government in which we were in coalition brought the uh, figures of, of uh, taxes uh, quite low because the, we have the corporate tax which is 10%, VAT is 20 but not for tourism, tourism is 7%, income tax is 10 and capital gains zero. So President Sarkozy comes as president to Bulgaria. Uh, what was it in 2006 I think or seven? And I accompanied him in the car to a conference of the French-speaking uh, Bulgarian University students. And in the car I said, Mr. President, I have to confess something. So he looked at me, confess? What, what do you mean? 
I said, well, you warned me not to do uh, uh, fiscal dumping. I'm afraid that uh, somehow didn't follow your advice because of our taxes being so low. So he enjoyed the joke and took it very well, fortunately. And we have <laughs> very, very good relations with France and the fact that we are in the international organization of French-speaking countries uh, does help us too. And yes, I mentioned the Middle East, but one of the reasons also of our good ties is that in the old days of the Cold War, a lot of students from the Middle Eastern countries were studying in Bulgaria. And also the fact that we have a substantial Muslim community in Bulgaria is another, I think, very, very important asset uh, in trade or in whatever relations we have with, uh, with uh, uh, Muslim countries. Uh, I have a sort of, uh, not fixation, but also an idea which I think is interesting, and that's the Black Sea community. There is already a bank and there is an association. The bank is in Greece, although Greece is not on the Black Sea, but they've had these trade posts in Hellenistic times. But Turkey has the presidency in uh, Turkey. And this community is a bit like a mini Mediterranean, but culturally and economically, it can be very interesting for an additional exchange of experience or of uh, trade or what have you. And finally, I have to thank, obviously, the support that uh, during my term in office, I always felt on behalf of the UK, not only from Her Majesty personally, but also from Prime Minister Blair, who in all the meetings and everywhere always would find a way to either support our views or put in a good word. And I had a very uh, worthy assistant in my cabinet who was sent uh, from the UK to work with me. And now he retired and he's the chairman of the Bulgarian British Chamber of Commerce in Sofia. So he also has uh, had a very, uh, I would say, positive result from his work in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria is trying to reform. We have so many qualified young people, not only in this room, but in many of the Ivy League universities in the States, that to me this is a great satisfaction because after all, we haven't had chances for years to leave the country. The economic means, you know what they are. And yet to see so many really fine, motivated and hardworking young people is a guarantee for the future. And I would like to finish this work precisely with that, that I'm very proud and grateful to these people to which a lot of sacrifice is involved in achieving these uh, marks, but I think that uh, Bulgaria's future is in many respects in their hands. Thank you. This is what I had to say. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we've got about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, can I just ask you before I ask you to raise your hands for questions, to just wait before you uh, ask your question for our assistance with the microphones to come to you because we are recording this event and we want your question to be picked up by the microphone. So, if anyone's got a question. Yep, we've got one here. Um, so, there's a microphone behind you. Um, hello. Uh, you spoke about being a pragmatist and then you spoke then afterwards about new people joining the EU. I was wondering if you could tell me your pragmatic opinion on the expansion of the EU, please. About new people joining the EU. Well, I, I have the feeling that Europe is not yet complete. So we have a few islands left, uh, such as what I mentioned, uh, Serbia or uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina or Albania or uh, 
Macedonia too, of course, that's an important neighbor for us. And then, eventually, uh, the other countries which are trying to join or are uh, conditioned. But then I think Europe really will be completed before going any further, because some people tend to see Europe expanding, quote unquote, into more uh, distant areas, which is more difficult. I mean, uh, for me, for instance, the issue of Turkey, which as a prime minister I was often asked by journalists and trying to, to needle me or get the wrong answer, I would always put uh, the following argument. In 1949, when NATO was formed, Turkey was a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Turkey's army was essential in the defense of the West during the years of the Cold War. And all of a sudden, when we start talking about money and different things, Turkey are actually Asiatic. They're not European, which I think is very, very unfair. Because only on the little triangle on the map of Turkey, the European Turkey, believe it or not, there are 23 million inhabitants which is Bulgaria, Greece, and I think Albania together. And yet people say, ah, oh, they're not European. So there also I think that it's interesting to see or give a chance to Turkey to decide whether they really want to join the EU, as they have a foot in Europe, or not. But not to sort of reject them, because that's where I think it could also trigger some other uh, reactions, as we all know, when there's a rejection, then there's nationalism or some religious, uh, how can I say, extremism. Yep. Uh, there is one more here, then we'll go to the other side. Your Majesty, a very uh, compelling and, and wonderful story. Um, I had a question. When you accepted the prime ministership, did you have any difficulties in accepting it precisely because, I guess, in, in accepting the position, um, you were putting your approval upon, say, a, a new regime? Well, uh, thank you, sir. You seem to read my thought. Uh, in a way, I first doubted that I would have the capability uh, for such a performance. So I'm terribly self-critical. So this took me a few hours or days to adjust. Then the fact that I was always taught by the people around me and by my mother uh, that the king was not involved in direct politics and stayed not above in the bad sense of the word, but stayed out of politics. So suddenly to be confronted with something that went, I would say, almost against my religious beliefs was an additional burden to, 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 to decide. Then, of course, the difficulty of who would I work with, because in 2000, and one, well, it was very recent still, after the changes. And after 50 years of one system, it's very difficult to expect people not to be involved in any way with the past. And to this day, I find it not quite honest from some of my fellow countrymen who try to say that they are always being staunch anti-communists, that they've never... See, Things in 50 years happen. We are all humans. We must take them as they are. And so I also had this third worry of who would I work with. But eventually I, I said, serving the country is the most important. Let's have a go at it. Um, hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you had an opinion of, uh, about a lot of the negative stereotypes uh, about, about Bulgarians, I guess, in, in Western Europe. And the, um, and the opinion about, pardon me? Uh, about the, um, the negative stereotypes, a lot of, uh, for example, the popular press in, in Western Europe often, uh, often peddles about, uh, about Bulgarians. I was wondering if you had an, uh, an opinion about that. Well, as I followed Bulgaria since I was six, and even the 50 years in exile, I would receive information or what have you, gather information through diplomats, through foreign travelers, through whatever, and after 89, I could catch up more directly. I felt, of 
course, I would see what was said about Bulgaria in the uh, West or by the Western media or the public opinion, which was, let's face it, not too uh, complimentary or not too positive. We had a very unfortunate episode as uh, some of the uh, less young people, I would put it in this room, might remember, was the famous umbrella case of a um, Bulgarian dissident who was uh, actually poisoned here in London with an umbrella and he eventually died and of course this stayed and left a very uh, dark and sinister uh, thing over uh, Bulgarian affairs. There were a few other things and finally when changes came again a lot of I would say more biased things were drummed up. Sometimes it's to cover issues, other times it's just because it's something alien and so you can't really trust it. But I think we are really reliable people and uh, it's, it's, uh, there's exceptions in everything. But to single out either ethnically or uh, religious or this is extremely unfair because for one person who maybe uh, deserves jail or what have you, to anathemize a whole nation is very sad. And I'll give a small example. I'm sorry to uh, speak so long, but it's just because it's something I feel very strongly about. Back in the early 70s in Germany, there were about two and a half million Turkish workers who worked for Volkswagen and other big companies. And Listening to the Germans, they weren't better foreign workers, they weren't better people than the Turks, thrifty, disciplined, uh, nice, discreet, uh, everything you want. When the first oil crisis, 74 or something, really came up, suddenly the German people or population, or some, I don't generalize myself, started saying, these people? Why do they have such moustaches? Why do they eat such strange stuff? Why do their wives cover their hair? And started picking on the alien, on the foreigner. So unfortunately in today's crisis, I think it's all too easy and for populistic purposes is almost ideal to pick on some newcomers and try and stigmatize them. So that's something which I also believe that in the European integration uh, we'll get over these things and after all it's also our responsibility as Bulgarians to prove others wrong in this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the inspiring talk, Your Majesty. Um, I actually found it quite interesting that you chose the word Muslim to describe uh, what historically would be called the, the ethnically Turkish people in Bulgaria. Um, first of all, I was wondering why you decided to do that. And secondly, um, what, what do you see? Is there involvement um, politically in the future of Bulgaria? Well, you see, I mentioned the Muslim uh, group in our population because it's a fact and it's also something, which, an issue which also makes many people somehow I don't know why nervous. In my childhood, nobody asked anybody what he was. I mean, that happened to be if you spoke to the person, but it wasn't something that you had branded here, nor a danger in one way or in another. Uh, uh, I can uh, personally also say that uh, we have always had very good relationship because the Turks who stayed in Bulgaria after the liberation of 1878, they stayed there because they felt at home. And they've been there since, and much to their credit. The Bulgarian, ethnically Bulgarian, who became Muslim over five centuries of Ottoman domination, chose Islam because maybe they, they preferred it, they saw something, but there it is. It's not a different. They are Bulgarians, and all of them anyway are born in Bulgaria. And we have part of our Roma people who are also Muslim. So this adds up to a substantial community. 
but I think it's an additional, how can I say, cultural uh, positive in a, in a country to be multi-ethnic or, or uh, different religions. And I think that uh, this fact has helped us in our economic uh, dealings with some of the Islamic countries. And I'm quite satisfied of this because we've seen that we've had this tolerance in Bulgaria because during communist days, towards the end in 1984, there was a movement to try and get people around, rallying around the flag of the Communist Party to expel Muslims under the excuse that they had to be, their names had to be Bulgarized. In those days we couldn't say Christian because we were not Christians, so we had to say something else. And this was a very unfair and terrible period in which 300,000 left the country. Some have fortunately come back, but it was something very unfortunate and I hope to God that really that never again anything like this will happen. And uh, I think that we have more or less managed. I have a tiny personal anecdote. My last youngest grandson, who was born in Bulgaria but lives in Morocco, my daughter had a great devotion for King Hassan of Morocco and said, Daddy, I have to call him Hassan. So the boy is called Simeon Hassan. And when this was published in Bulgaria, I had some of the MPs who are Muslims come up to me and say, we are going to dance at Hassan, not Simeon Hassan, at Hassan's wedding. So <laughs> you see that it was a good thing. Uh, perhaps I'll go this side. Uh, yep, over here. And then I'll go the other side as well. And then back this side. Hi. Um, recently, there have been some very inspiring um, democratic pro protests in Bulgaria. And um, the people were quite successful in um, demanding fair rights. And the government resigned. And yes. then a new government was put together. And I just wanted to get your opinion on kind of what, what you um, would hope for the, the future of the Bulgarian democracy. Thank you. I sincerely hope that the future of our democracy is uh, promising and solid. What happened, and this was, I think, not understood, or it was something very new. The government had resigned or fallen. Elections come. The largest party, which would be ruling prior to these elections, had the majority, but not sufficient, and wasn't able to form a coalition with some other parties, which was a new uh, premier, shall we say. So they had to hand in their, um, not resignation, but just the fact that they couldn't form a government. And the president told the next party in size to do it. And they did. So some people felt that this was cheating them because one party had more, more votes but didn't have the majority. But this in any democracy is common practice, whether it's pleasant for the party in charge or not, is another thing. I mentioned that we had 119. I could have had a few less, and then we would have been in the same dilemma, but we managed to find uh, allies. Whereas in the case of uh, Prime Minister General Borisov, he didn't, and so this has happened. But it's not any cheating. It's not going against the people's votes. It's simply the next two parties who form it. Eventually, other elections will tell but to try and have the government resign because supposedly uh, they've, uh, I mean, not been democratic is also, I think, lack of democratic understanding, if not thinking. And I believe that being in the EU, sooner or later, whether some people like it or not, we have to play by the same rules, i.e. Uh, abide by them and, and be a normal democracy. Thank you. Question in the back over there. Your Majesty, um, like most people who've spoken before, I'd like to thank you for coming in to speak to us today. You spoke very eloquently and persuasively about the advantages of um, being a member of the EU that Bulgaria enjoys. Um, and also, you, but you also mentioned um, some of the, some of the uh, arguments made by opponents of European integration, and I was going to ask, do you think that in spite of all the problems Europe's facing, all the instability in the EU, especially with regard to the Euro, 
Do you think that most Bulgarians, um, or of your opinion, do you think that most Bulgarians want to deepen integration even further? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because I can't speak for all Bulgarians. Uh, there's definitely, there was a great enthusiasm uh, till the year 2008 or 9, I would say, for the EU, because this really was a solution for us. Later, with the crisis, with one thing and another, many times I said populistic attitudes or some sort of pressure or from one side or the other trying to say that this is all a catastrophe and this. You have this. Uh, we saw that after Bulgaria and Romania, now a new country has joined, which I think is a very healthy sign. I remember when in, 19, in 2004, nine countries, which we, or ten, there were ten, we called it the Big Bang, joined the EU, but Bulgaria and Romania were left out. I was very much concerned because I thought, oh my God, until these ten countries are, if you'll excuse me the expression, digested by Brussels, they'll take a dim view of any newcomers, but thank God it came quite soon after, 2004, 2007, and we joined the EU. There might be m more Eurosceptic people now in Bulgaria, but it's also a matter of the situation and a little bit of a fashion to say, well, where will we be or what else is there as an alternative for us? I don't think that little Bulgaria could stand all by itself, no matter how I love the country and respect it. I'll take two more questions. The gentleman uh, there. Over there. Tuka, the gentleman. And, and, and here, yeah. yeah. So, and last question over here. Uh, thank you, Your Majesty. Uh, I want to ask, because you mentioned your close personal friendship with King Juan Carlos, and having both had a various experience of coming back from a country that's been so faced by political divides of authoritarian dictatorships, have you learned from each other in how to re-establish some sense of political community within a nation, and if so, how? Well, it's uh, certainly uh, King Juan Carlos's, how can I say, evolution or performance, because it has been one, uh, is something that we've all admired and as a matter of fact many people in Bulgaria thought that since the Juan Carlos model in Spain worked, Simeon would work too. But there there are two fundamental differences. A. General Franco for the past 30 years before the king became king had already stated that the succession would be a monarchy. And the monarchy had nominally remained. And B, that the Franco regime was a dictatorship, but not a totalitarian system, whereas we in Bulgaria, we had a totalitarian system. And that's an entirely different story, believe me. So we couldn't compare, or I at least couldn't possibly do anything to, to <laughs> how can I say, to have the same uh, success or the same evolution as King Juan Carlos, but it certainly helped us a lot and he visited Bulgaria twice, which gave many people a sort of, uh, how can I say, um, support. And the first time he visited Bulgaria, the people started shouting, Simeon, Simeon. So he was a bit put off coming to the Republic and uh, called me up from Sofia and said, Simeon, what kind of republic is this where people are calling your name? So I said, look, it's because they don't know how to say long live King Juan Carlos that they <laughs> use me. And this way it was accepted. And a uh, final question over here. Does your majesty... Yep. Does your majesty feel that the common European currency has been universally beneficial for the countries that have adopted it, or are there a few countries where it has created more obstacles than it's solved to date, and how is that issue to be overcome? Well, I can't answer for any other of my colleagues or former fellow prime ministers, each has his difficulties, his voters, his past. But uh, I think it's a matter of adjustment and of common sense for all of us. And it's a thing of either or, because else 
again, I repeat it, and I sound that I'm uh, reiterating things, but I feel so strongly about the importance of this mega uh, structure. Uh, the states took quite a uh, century and some at least to, to uh, become the United States. I hope it won't take so long in Europe, but it's been going already 60 some years. So I think that the period is, is advancing and it's uh, the only way to be able to avoid what we've been witnesses of and to feel confident in a strong economic future. And culturally, I do think that Europe, with all due respect, is really one of the centers of the world and we shouldn't waste it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking and showing our gratitude to His Majesty cool. King Simin for his yes. illuminating speech and comments and for honoring us presence. Thank you for having me in this event. Thank you. Не приспах никого. Не приспах никого. Не приспах никого.